right, so Mark Nober, the guy behind the uh, flashy, very well curated digital Instagram page and the uh, and the uh, great resume and the digital agency and the acting and the businesses and all this stuff. I'm trying to get to the core today. I want to figure out how this man came from Calgary originally out to UVic and then suddenly started this barrage of businesses and then throughout all that came to the conclusion of where you're at today which is a digital agency am i wrong no you're you're right something like that right <clears throat> you're not wrong did I, did I, is this a little it. summary i don't know <laughs> there's a lot of things it's weird when you hear somebody else sum up your life because you're like oh yeah how old are you mark i am 31 turn 32 in may look great for 31 that's it's very kind of you no to say. problem buddy yeah there was a real shift in my life in the last five years with i do i've been modeling since i was 18 and i remember going out for the role of like hot guy or cool dude and then all of a sudden one day it became dad role <laughs> and it was like i just it, it was kind of sad when you're going to the audition room and everybody else is 40 45 dad bod and you're still 28 at that point in time and you're like okay and so for someone to say you look good for your age i'm like i'm gonna hold on to that comment i'm gonna go home i'm gonna write that in my diary <laughs> i remember today somebody said i looked <laughs> january <sub-30."> 14th <laughs> someone said i looked young <laughs> I got ID'd at the bar today. Today was a good day. Today was a great day. <coughs> yeah. No. Um, you are actually. I, I didn't. I didn't think you're. If I was gonna put it. If I was gonna put my thumb on it, I'm gonna say late twenties, maybe. Cool. Something like that. You know what it is? I think. Uh, I think it's just not, the people gonna laugh, but it's just being white. Like, like honestly, we hit a certain age. Dead ass. We hit, we, hit, we hit a certain age. We hit like, for me, for me, it was this year. And everybody started looking around like, man, you look, you look, you look old. I, said, I would never have thought you were 22. I'll say that. Uh, or if that's not public knowledge, 42. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Which, that's another conversation we have. We're like, listen, should we, sh- sh- should we hide your age from guests? I'm like, nah, fuck it. Let's roll with it. It's fine. No, uh, I, I mean, you know what's funny is I think age... I just went to Nepal with my mom. My mom is 67 years old. She, we went with 29 other people aged 22 to, let's say, 40. Yep. My mom kicked everyone's ass. No way. It was the most inspiring trip of my life because it showed me that age isn't anything but the opportunity to gain wisdom. It's the opportunity to gain experiences, and it's the immense amount of knowledge that she pertains about herself, about her surroundings, about engagements, about so much that, you know, this small five foot four woman kicked every one of our asses to the top of that mountain and back down. What does she work at? Like how, how, how? She rides horses. She's German. I don't know. I honestly, I don't know. She gets up every morning, does a little, like not P90X, but like Jillian Michaels, yeah, I like, like I workout like video. I like it. I like it. And I, I, like, I don't know. It was a really neat trip for that reason. Cause I looked at that thinking, I spent a lot of my life in the mountains and I'm thinking like, oh, this will be a cakewalk. And I got humbled and I'm watching this woman and there was one day where I slept in and my mom gets up at four, joins 20 other people, only six of them make it to the top and my mom's one of them. Wow. And I'm thinking, this is pretty amazing. Like this is what can be done at 67 years old. So to wake up at 32 or 31 and be like, oh, I don't know. Like I just look at her and it's an easy transition to think, you know, age doesn't mean anything. She, wow, sorry, that's crazy. Yeah, it's cool. Um, did you hit the genetic genetic jackpot then? I wouldn't <sighs> think so. My dad's six foot four and British. My mom's five foot four and German. I'm exactly to the millimeter, the height between them. Nice. My I dad like was skinny and lanky, and my mom's small and powerful. So no, because I tried to go to the Olympics for track cycling, I needed to be shorter and more powerful. I was a track runner in high school. Didn't have the power then. So, no, I didn't hit the genetic jackpot in any sport. So Right. You were kind of like <laughs> mediocre all around. Exactly. I was Perfect. good but never great. You know that like book it. that's good to great? Didn't work for me. Relentless? Is that Relentless that is... Yeah. Well, there's one called good to great. Is that one? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. What's, what's Relentless? Relentless is good to great to... Uns- Probably better than great. Always greater. <laughs> have you read that book? No. no. It was good. Tim Grover? Yeah. Uh... He's a uh, Michael Jordan trainer, Kobe Bryant trainer, Charles Barkley trainer. No way. 
uh, yeah, he just speaks about X Factor, X Factor in, in humans, guys that are just kind of like, just, you know, have that Kevin Garnett in him, have that little edge to him, that so chip the on zone, the shoulder. The concept of the zone. Concept of the zone. That's the way he actually describes it is tapping into your dark side. That's how you get to the zone. And that's why he goes into a, into depth, and I'm going to butcher his book, and I apologize, but... It's okay. We have a fact check. Yeah, literally. Um, he's He talks about you have to be... You have to have a certain amount of negative in your life to be unstoppable. You can't get... Like, there has to be a high threshold of negative that you've had to gone through and anger and angst and emotion and depression for you to ever get to that Kobe 81-point game <laughs> or whatever, right? And just to even get in the zone in anything that you're doing, which I think is a really interesting concept. You've been an athlete your whole life. Have you been in the Correct. zone? Do you remember the moments where you've hit that zone? Do you feel like you've been there? For sure. Um, m- maybe, like, twice. I'm with you. Verbatim twice. Maybe like twice. And they stand out like moments you'll never forget in your mind. Where were your moments? Where were your moments? One was a soccer game, and it was pouring with rain, and I just remember everything hit slow motion. Yeah. I knew everything around me. I could feel the rain on my body, the wind like uh, crowing through my hair, and I just remember like looking and knowing exactly where that ball was going to go in the goal. And then the other one was I was racing track. How old were you? How old were you that first one? Would have been in university. It was twenty. So you think about it. It was twenty years before I got into the zone. Which you means played, that you I'm, played soccer in university. Uh, I was playing like a, like, like a league, but it wasn't at university. I was playing yeah, yeah Div yeah. One or whatever outside. But what's interesting is how delayed it was in my life that I experienced that. Um, mm. I ski raced when I was younger. I did every sport I could. You can imagine rock climbing, soccer, baseball, whatever. But it was interesting that it took that long for me to experience that. Mm take a step forward. My next one was when I was trying to go to the Olympics for track cycling. Mm. And I just remember a moment where there's an event called a, uh, it's, uh, it's called a Kirin, which is where a motorcycle leads the loop. The motorcycle peels off and there's eight riders. First one across the line. It's a race of carnage. It means to fight. And you're going about 65, 70 kilometers an hour. Full speed wow. in a spandex suit. So if you hit the ground, you're toast. You're toast. And I just remember there's literally everything again, slow motion. Psych- I saw a hole literally about the size of like between the water ball and the stand here. And I was like, that's what I'm going through. Really? And I went through it and I won that race. And I'll never forget that moment because it was as if everything had just been put on slow motion. How'd you get to that spot? Adrenaline, uh, desire, definitely an, under- definitely an undertone of desire, wanting it. Like I wanted, I had the fortune of working with Simon Whitfield, who was Canada's first gold medalist in the Olympics for triathlon when it was first introduced in Sydney in 2008. Fact check is allowable. And um, <laughs> what, I, what I learned from that experience was if I took top-level athletes and put them under a stress test and loaded them. So let's, we'll use a simple exercise, a leg extension. Sure. If I put you on a leg... I'll speak for myself. If I put myself on a leg extension and mm-hmm. just put a load, let's say, 150%. Yeah. And I go to a full extension and hold it there. Mm-hmm. Well, at what point am I going to give out? So it's just a static hold. Yeah. I get to the point of like probably further than 80% of people, uncomfortable, shaky, feeling a little vomity. Yeah. I'd quit. I'd yeah. give up 100%. Yeah. yeah. I tested Simon Whitfield and the guy passed out. No. He held that contraction until he literally passed out. I did that with three other top podium athletes. They all passed out. So what I, what I learned from that experience was those guys who are hitting the zone more frequently are also the same people that are going to that point where they can suffer harder than anybody else, which mm-hmm. leads you back to your point of how dark can you go? How dark can you go? And it's almost like a desire to want to get dark. Like, it's not like, like if I'm running, for instance, like the, I'll, I'll, the furthest I'll ever run is like a half marathon. I'm not a marathon guy like that. I can't, yeah. I can't, I can't, I can get there. I'm not there yet. And around kilometer like 16, 17, 18, you get to this spot where you're like, you almost want to feel a little bit more pain. Because mm-hmm. once you feel, because you, you almost, in, you intuitively are like, if I feel a little bit more pain, if I feel a little bit more discomfort, I can tap into something and then my body kind of just becomes fluid, right? Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's the key to getting there. It's the same thing when you're lifting weights. You've had great lifting, weight lifting sessions, I'm sure, where you've, you know, 
got PBs or, or whatever it may be, like trying to pinpoint that spot where you change from, oh yeah, I'm just picking up my bags and go to the gym to, no, I'm here, I'm engaged and I'm lifting the fuck out of this 500 pounds or 400 pounds or whatever this is, right? Somewhere along that timeline, mm-hmm. something happened, right? Totally. How do you, re- like, I don't know. Anyways, that's what that's what Tim talks about in his cool. book. I'm gonna have to check that out. Definitely check that out. <clears throat> Relentless is Relentless is very very cool. Uh, I coached um, a U U17 club ball team last year or the year before, and it was a must read. It was if you're coming, yeah. we'll buy you the we'll buy you the book for you. You got to read it, and <laughs> you, you got a chapter by chapter. Shoot me a text. No way. <clears throat> yeah. Very cool. What'd you get from it? And uh, just to get players understanding the caliber of, of what you actually can do and how do you get there and, and, and all that stuff, right? Putting I really there. appreciate what you did there by bringing that into the athlete's mindset and saying, don't just read it from start to finish. Don't just try and absorb it all. Break it down. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> chapter one, by chapter. One of my biggest issues with so many books that provide such great knowledge is that you get most of it in the opening chapter. <laughs> Which is why I feel like anybody can write a business book because it will only take us one chapter to do so. Yeah, business books are fugazi. It doesn't that doesn't work. I, I, in my opinion, it's totally. But that's what I think is great. Is you said okay, even though this chapter may have some regurgitated content. Yeah. What is the takeaway? How does this chapter impact you? What's the one <clears throat> thing that you're pulling from it? Mm-hmm. Everyone's going to pull something different, but what is the one thing that you're seeing? So I'm sure that every one of those text messages totally for different chapters is totally different. Totally different. Totally different. And, and different in terms of the level of. So you can see the level of effort. I mean, that's why that's why you used to write, uh, was it like book studies or journal studies? And, and I, you start to understand the teacher's mindset a little bit. Like you can decode the, like how far did you go in this text? Like, did you read it? Did you really absorb it? Did you go sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, or did you skim through, mm-hmm. right? And you can kind of start to see, and then that reflects on the level of athlete. So the, the kids didn't know this, and a lot of the kids listen to this podcast now, so that you're, you're getting you're getting lit on, on some stuff now. We used to score them every day at, at a 10. Yeah. Part of it would be effort, part of it would be attitude, part of it would be be um, uh, special play, like a special play didn't have to be on the court. My favorite special play was when uh, we had a practice, a scrimmage against a bunch of college guys. Uh, one of our players shot the shot to essentially tie the game, just a scrimmage or whatever, come back and he's heads down. And one of my guys runs up to him and grabs his jaw and just pushes it up. It was so gangster. It That's was like, awesome. it was. it's one of the highlights of that whole thing. Um, Anyway, so we would score them, and then the last one would be um, where you get a point or two points, I forget what it was, off of how far you went into on on the book, or <laughs> if you referenced that, or if you referenced, we would give little expert uh, excerpts from uh, monologues or from different interviews from you know Kobe, Charles, Michael, these guys, that, like just little bits on every, and I'd have one at the top of my practice plan every day, and that's what you'd bring to practice. And you're like, hey, did you absorb that? Did you show any of that, or did you just hear me say it? And that was it, right? Anyways, there's tons of cool shit you can do with them. Um, with players, coaching is coaching is very fun. Do you, have you done any coaching yourself? Uh, <clears throat> along my journey from Calgary to here, <clears throat> I I um yeah lots. When I was a kid, I was really fortunate. My parents used to send me to these outdoor adventure camps in Switzerland because my parents are European. Oh shit! It's also known as daycare, but uh, <laughs> they uh, so from the ages of probably like I'm gonna say eleven to sixteen, every year I'd go to Switzerland. Sweet. And, I went back 10 years to the day and I was a counselor. So I coached and taught outdoor education and then I became the coordinator and then I came, became the curriculum coordinator wow. and then I became the program coordinator. So I ran and designed the, the school programs. Sweet. So I got to do a lot of coaching. I had to coach, I had a staff at one time of about 300 people mm. and I did all of their coaching and then I got to do my own groups as well and I'd coach either environmental studies or survival techniques or travel techniques. Uh, but yeah, it, you know, it's, it really doesn't matter what facet or what playground you're playing on. There's a mental aspect to it. That's mm-hmm. always about refinement. Mm-hmm. And I think even with, like, especially with coaching, you really learn it because the best coaches, I saw a great article the other day. Um, but the best coaches are the ones who aren't just sh- spieling the whole time. They're the ones pulling content. Totally. Um, one of the guys that runs space in our studio is a good partner of ours. He put this article on my desk, and I was—I should ask him why, but it was—he was, he was showing the two different leadership styles, 
And I guess it was Seahawks versus someone else recently. And the coach sure. of the other team, it was a tie game. And I guess it shouldn't have been a tie game. I don't really know. Yeah. Anyways, and the coach of the other team essentially turned around his team. as like, too bad our kicker couldn't kick a ball when it's his time to do his job. And the Seahawks guy turned around and said, it doesn't matter if you miss, he hit every other one. And it's like, that's a totally different mentality and a way of supporting and leading. Totally. And which team would you want to be on? Mm-hmm. Which team is going to have the better support and morale system that trickles down? Mm-hmm. Right? Refinement. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. I think if you pull, like if you pull, if you extract, 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 people are so interesting. Like there's an, inf- like part of the reason I love doing this podcast is there's an infinite amount of information that humans hold inside of them, right? Because we have so many variations and perspectives that looking at one single water bottle or one totally. single pen, right? The way you, it's in that, that go, that's an infinite amount of knowledge that you can go. And so seeing somebody, a uh, player um, through a two hour practice or a two hour game, the amount of information you can pull from that person is just like infinite. Did, what did you get your degree in? <laughs> um, oh, sorry, I, I laugh yeah. because I don't call it, <laughs> I don't really, uh, Associate with my degree over really much. I graduated from 22 different faculties at the University of Victoria. So, so. my degree is, I was, we were kind of talking about it before the show, but uh, I have a degree in the human dimensions of climate change, which essentially means I studied how the environment and business interact and impact um, economics and vice versa. So <laughs> the easiest way to sum it up. If I look at it from an economic standpoint, yep. so ecological economics and environmental economics, environmental economics would look at a tree and go, I'll cut down that giant tree, I'll make 10,000 pieces of paper, build one house. Yeah. Ecological economics goes, that tree creates oxygen, it's soil salination, it provides grounding, shelter for birds, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that tree from an economics perspective, from environmental economics would go, mm, it's maybe a million dollar tree. That tree from an ecological economics perspective looks at it going, that's a billion dollar tree. Is it worth cutting down? Wow. So it starts to take in life services. Right. And additional services that we don't usually know how to calculate. Hmm. So when I got into that degree, I went to university with no idea what I wanted to do. Of course. Uh, as is an, an unfortunate truth for most people. Yep. And I say it's an unfortunate truth because as I learned 10 years from the day that I think I entered university is it now is when I'd value it the most, when I'm mature enough and understandable enough to know what I'd actually want to learn. Mm-hmm. Then I went because it was something my parents said I had to do. And it was expected of me. And I was under this bullshit enigma that I needed a degree to get a job. Oh, shit. Here we go. <coughs> and, it's about to pop off. <laughs> and I mean, we've all read the Steve Jobs thing or the Bill Gates thing or whoever it was that didn't, didn't go. go to university. Great. Cool. Outliers are awesome. Yeah. The truth is, is I've never, ever, ever been asked at any professional setting what my degree is. <laughs> I've asked, been asked, what's my experience? Yeah. What have I been in? Who do I know? Probably the most important question is, who do I know? Yeah, totally. Who have you worked with? Who have you worked with? Yeah. That has nothing to do with my degree. Nothing. So when I was at university, I was very much looking for the easiest route through it. Mm-hmm. And I did. And I found this degree and it had no homework because the books didn't exist. There was no book for ecological economics because it was so new. Right. There was literally a midterm and a final. And I got my degree and I officially finished university, like I said, with a 50.2% average. I got a D. Right. D's get degrees. D's get degrees. If there's one takeaway from this podcast, <laughs> D's get degrees. Yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> At the same time, I wasn't just dicking around, but it was like... <laughs> you were doing something. I was doing something else. But it was just the fact that the <clears throat> function of the situation, the way the society has built us up... University is an incredibly valuable asset if you know what you're using the asset for. Totally. I don't think it's a valuable asset to just go throw darts at a dartboard hoping it's going to inspire you because the real world, meeting someone, reading someone, talking to someone is what's going to give you that inspiration, getting that experience. I agree. I agree. But I also think that that's contextual. So it, it's, for different, it's for different people. Like, for totally. instance, uh, you know, I didn't finish. The, the, one, the one question I always get is, is you know, who, who do you work with? Who have you worked for? What have you done? Right. That's kind of, yep. and then there might be a, where'd you go to school? And if they ask, where did I go to school? I'll say you Vic. And that's where the conversation ended. <laughs> yeah. ends, right. So I, I just, got, I just got, I paid for one year for the price of four right there. You know what I'm saying? And, and so that's one thing. But for me, I think you, I made a shit ton of mistakes in the real world that cost me, you know, tens of thousands of dollars and relationships and girlfriends and, and all this stuff that I could have made in this, I don't want to say fake world, but this fluffy 
kind of smaller ecosystem of people and professors that totally. the consequences aren't necessarily that drastic versus when I'm out here trying to be an adult, trying to be in the real world, you know, real world things have real world consequences and you pay the fucking price. Like that's what people ask me all the time. Like, do you, do you regret it? And I'm like, no, absolutely, absolutely not. Because I mean, my learning curve has just been accelerated, you know, like none other just because of the caliber of people I've been very fortunate to be around. But at the end of the day, it doesn't, some people need that. Mm -hmm. Some people need that. That four years. You know, so I've, when I was 15, if someone were like, hey, listen, 21-year-olds, 22-year-olds, they're kids. You know, if someone would have just said that to me, I'd be like, I, I would have stopped trying to be like them. I would have started to try to be like 30-year-olds. And mm -hmm. people that, you know, I feel like a gentleman like yourself is kind of at that age where you're like, oh, I've figured things out in a certain sense. Obviously, you figure out how much you don't know mm -hmm. that humbles you but you're like oh no i have a foundation of knowledge and I, I understand what my moral compass is a little bit now and now i can actually build off this and i thought that point was at 20 you know what i mean or maybe i'm totally wrong i don't know no i don't think you are and i mean that's a beautiful thing like you said is perspective to put it into perspective i moved to victoria from living in new york singapore milan toronto honolulu I moved from the fashion capital. Modeling, of the world. just yeah, 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 yeah. And I went from <laughs> literally staying up all night and going to fashion events to Victoria. <laughs> like it was a total sociological. Why? Why Victoria? A couple of reasons. My high school girlfriend was there. I wanted to run track and field for the school. I okay. wanted to be. I, cycling was a big part of my life. It's all a good right, place right, to be. Right, so like, right. um, but there was a mindset. Shift. But it was a mindset shift. But what's What's interesting is, is I'm 32 and I still don't know anything. And I was 21 and I still didn't know that's anything. That's bad news, buddy. And at 15, I still didn't know anything. And that's what's so cool is the acknowledgement is I don't know anything, but I can keep learning. And there's a really great thing. And Chip Wilson is clearly a proponent of this is there's three facets of knowledge. There's the stuff you know you know. I know this is a water bottle. It holds water. There's the stuff I know I don't know. I know that's a computer, but I don't know what's inside of that computer. Yeah. And then there's the stuff I don't know, I don't know. Like, that's what I live for. And that's how I'm going to grow, is by really living a life where I don't know where it's taking me, but as long as I'm jumping on the opportunities, creating the opportunities, or challenging the opportunities, I'm going to learn more about the stuff I don't know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. When I was 15, I thought... The direction I was going made sense. Mm -hmm. When I went to university, I thought the same thing. But looking back, I realized none of it did. And what I mean by that is I was fighting what the people who were smarter than me were telling me. So the people who were to become my mentors in the future and people that I looked up to were just trying to give me simple things, but I was smarter than they were at that age. And to this day, I still have to challenge myself on being smarter than those people. But mm -hmm. it's, it is something that is what makes you recognize that the direction that life is going is based off of the knows, the not knowing, and the no you don't know. Mm -hmm. And university for me would have been a much different experience had I gone into it with, I don't know, like really accepting that. Like, I don't know what I'm going to study. I don't know what I want to do. But if I'd been much more open to accepting that instead of fighting that, I was, I was fighting it, being like, I'm at university. This is a waste of time. Instead of being like, I'm at university. This is a great time. Fuck, I was the same way. Right? I was and, the total same way. And that's, <clears throat> if I was to look at my life, I don't regret anything, but if I look at one of the biggest mistakes I made, it was that I didn't change that perspective. Yeah. The one thing that university offers you uh, that really stands out to me, obviously it offers many things. Let's go with two things. Is the networking of your peers. Yeah and the accessibility to intelligence. Totally. Those teachers, as much as they're standing at the front of the class, are the most willing people to partner and teach. Totally. And I remember like Andrew Weaver, who's head of the BC chair, um, head of the Green Party for the islands, I think. Um, had a, he was a Nobel laureate, was okay. one of my teachers. And I got yeah. to work with him on a project. What and, did like, he teach? He was ecological. Of course he was. Yeah, something. Obviously. I don't remember that then. Some hippie shit. EOS, Earth and Ocean Science is 256. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, um, but through him, I got to go work with the Dave Suzuki Foundation. And in line with you, I got an opportunity to go work for Nike. 
Mm. Uh, and you're in the Nike camp. I was offered a job, yeah, but I turned it down. You um, didn't go. You didn't go to Nike. I went down there to go interview. You but, seem like a Nike guy. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna be honest with you. Hey, I would. Uh, it, it's. Uh, It'll happen still. You're 100 percent a Nike guy. <laughs> That's hilarious. I actually cringe every time I I meet Nike guys because I know they're fucking psychos. <laughs> I uh, when I was when I was 19, I got a chance to come work with um, a Nike exec. Had just left um, Nike. He was the uh, brand uh, God uh, head of global brand direction for Nike basketball. Um, it's very very high up and um he left to start his own digital agency and how nike responded to that was fine go ahead and leave but we're just gonna hire you to do all the same shit for us <laughs> that you were doing and so you know i went and, and, and worked for him for a year in vancouver that's how i initially got here uh no coaching way. and doing a lot of content and stuff like that he he um a lot of my success and future successes are because of him and fuck that guy but he's a he's an asshole amazing guy when I say like, if I call you an asshole, that's with the highest level of respect. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. the highest level of respect. And you know, the people that came through that door from the Nike campus, you know, I had no business being in the room, but each of them spoke and carried themselves with a certain demeanor yeah. and the way they'd attack problems with the, was with a certain methodology and they'd always see big picture. They'd always reverse engineer things. They always had a certain way of speaking and understanding concepts and, in just an hour with you, you have a similar mindset. I don't want to blow smoke up your ass. But. It's too funny because my <clears> – <throat> so I ski professionally for a company called Peak Performance. Right. And my country manager used to be the head of Nike and Adidas. <laughs> so it's funny because I always look up to him as like a mentor in the industry. But Probably a different type of person, right? Very different. Very different mentality. And it's not necessarily an attempt mentality. Like I definitely embrace aspects of it. But – um I think everybody has something great to offer. Like you look at the Chip Wilson mentality. If I, you went full Chip Wilson, full Lululemon mentality, like half the people think you're a cult and crazy. <laughs> Same thing if you go to the extreme with Nike. Like I think that within, there's a cup, I don't remember who I was talking to about this the other day, but it was, you can take something, let me rephrase this. There's no perfect recipe. So if something works for someone, it doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Totally. But there's aspects of it that you can take that you mm -hmm. can craft and design for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's really important is that you've got, and again, going back to university, because I think it's, important perspective is had I known that lesson, had I recognized that the teachers and the mentorships and the people that I could have met, I could have definitely used now much more mm -hmm. going into and starting peeled media and doing what we're doing. I was never in that field. I went to study business and I thought everything they were doing in the business school was wrong. I, I owned two, a gym at that time. I was starting a second one. I was making great money. And I was like, this business school, why am I sitting here doing statistics when right now yeah. what I really need to understand is algorithms and how yeah. search engine marketing works. Yeah. And the problem for me that I saw with university right off the bat was it was archaic mentality. It was learn, but it's too late. Like what you're learning is too late it's, yeah. it, because technology is going faster. It's gone. But there's still the people that are there. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that are housing the knowledge, regardless of what they're trying to teach you. They're the ones who, like you said, with that mentality of Nike, to link everything back together, they're able to say, okay, what's the big picture? We may not be teaching this, but I can see what's happening and I can understand where it came from. Mm -hmm. And this is how you link it forward. And you get in the house to be able to make that link, right? Exactly. If you're smart enough to absorb it. That's why I think university should start for people at 30. Because wow. you need your 20s to figure out what the fuck is going on in this world. And to experience it and to fall down and make mistakes. And then imagine what happens if you stepped in university at 30. Totally. So. Totally. I, your perspective on age is very is uh, a little bit pessimistic for a young person, <laughs> but um, I kind of I kind of share the same thought and philosophy in that you know I, I I feel I have a lot going on in my life, but my number one priority is just to avoid the pitfalls of being a 22 year old male. You know, like there's there's a lot of shit that uh, can go left, and Wait, I see a lot of my on, peers stop. go through. What is a pitfall of 22, dude? Like, oh my god, are you me, serious? Give me your biggest pitfall of 22. I'll give you I'll give I'll give you pitfall. So. Women, number one. I have an amazing girlfriend. Shout out to Tracy. Um, but that is absolutely a pitfall. You can just get sidetracked for months, weeks, years. That's not 22, dude. Dude. That's, that's 22. That's 26. That's 32. Mark, that's I, I, Mark, that's I, my 67-year-old mom. I got testosterone <laughs> coming out of my fucking ears, buddy. So you know what I'm saying? masturbate more. Like, all of these things are Jim, controllable. jerk off. Jim, jerk <laughs> off. <laughs> Jerking off is... Yeah. That's a conversation. Before, but, before, yeah. before you make any major decision in your life, jerk off, okay? Trust me. <laughs> Trust me. You'll think about it a different way. 
Um, that's a pitfall. But oh, see, I disagree. I think that the problems that you're talking about yeah. at any age still is, exist. It still exists Fuck at any off. age Damn because. It. <laughs> we know that the women challenge exists look at the divorce rates like everything it's just the only thing that changes is the way that you're approaching it that doesn't mean the problem doesn't exist those pitfalls exist at any age it's just how are you approaching it i went to i have a life coach therapist it was the best investment of my life i was like this is the most insane i'm spending 250 dollars for this person to talk about how fucked up i am at the end of the day i realized that first of all that's not what's happening i'm not the pitfall It's the lack of my way of approaching a problem. Right. And understanding the problem. Mm. Same thing. It doesn't matter. At any point in our life, those problems could theoretically be the same or a morphic of that that thing, of that problem. It's just how we're approaching it. So whatever... Testosterone is a bit of a different thing. Go for a run and nah. you'll probably, don't worry, that will drop. <laughs> in about six years, you'll be, you'll be wishing you were 22 testosterone-wise. But... From a girlfriends, from a business relationships, from a family perspective, the problems are always there, mm. regardless of age. It's just how we're approaching them. Okay, so you know what? I appreciate you for for pushing my thought a little bit in this because no, like I could say that and someone would be like, ah, shit, I know what you mean, and they'll be like, ah, I was that time, I was that age too, and and that kind of it goes off down a different road. But let me rephrase that. So, I'm trying to avoid the pitfalls of this section in the learning curve. Because it's a point where I think I know a lot. Yeah, I think I, I've also kind of gotten <laughs> over the hump of ignorance and realized I don't know dick. But, you know, you're well versed enough where you've had some experiences. I've had a couple wins in the business world and athletics. And you're like, oh, shit, you know what? I could do this. Like, I can do this without a degree. And I can do this without, you know, financial support from parents. And you're like, oh, I, I can do things. And you start to gain a knowledge base. And then you will also start to get a little bit of experience. And then you, you overreach. And, and you can maybe become a little bit too ambitious. Like, for instance, uh, I'm gonna sorry. Yeah, I'm gonna go inject. ahead. I know you're go ahead. You're on a flow, but this is your opening line for your podcast. Do you think Zuckerberg has a fucking clue what he's doing? No, yeah. because guess what? Nobody's leading his way. He's the first to do what he's doing. You're the first to do your own life the way you're doing it. So, no one is leading your way. No one is leading my way. <clears throat> We have the world around us and what people are doing. And all we can do is learn from what they're doing and see if it applies. Hmm. Zuckerberg is in the exact same situation. Granted, billions in the bank. But the thing is, is no one is telling him how to do it because there's nobody to look up to that is doing his life, that is doing his company. There's no Facebook 2.0. There's no other company that he can go, oh, I see how they're doing it. We'll just copy it. Or... Look at the mistake they made. We shouldn't do that. Right. Every mistake he's made, he's the first one to make that mistake. And that's where the mind-blowing aspect of this world that we live in really foster. Like, we have to foster that. Yeah. So, going back to what you're saying, Hmm. think Hmm. about it. Yeah. I I, I get it. (laughs) I I get what you're saying. And it's that's the space you want to play in. Like, that's the space you want to play in. That's you want to go to the playground in that you don't know what you don't know. Like, taking that first step, like, I have no clue what is going to happen here, but it's going to be okay. But, I mean, I, I get it, but I still steadfast, and I think that there's some truth in, I don't mean to shit on my peer group, but, man, I see a lot of people from my peer group fuck up in a lot of ways, you know, in, in a lot of ways. And in a variety of different, and I don't mean to like shit, I like women, like mm-hmm. hey man, you're too beautiful. That's why you're a problem for guys like me. Like, <laughs> stuff, you know what I'm saying? But you know, there's, whether that's financially, like when I got into business, the first thing I got attracted to was in university, I made a bunch of, bunch of, bunch of money day trading. And I was like, oh my God, I know how to do this. Pattern recognition. And it's another, another conversation, but I thought that I was instantly good. And there's just tendencies of being this age that you just kind of have to get over. And so this podcast has been a huge growing point for me because I get to sit down, you know, once a week or two, twice a week or three times a week or whatever it is that we do and just sit here and be like, all right, today, you don't know dick. You know, <laughs> <laughs> today is the day where you're just a mirror and you get to mirror thoughts and, and, and thought processes and ideas off someone so they can advance. And you're just going to sit there and, and be witness to it. How about that? And you're like, all right, okay. And a lot of times I'll like, you know, for instance, a lot of podcasts, I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm more here, right? You got me fired up in a way. <laughs> <laughs> that was my goal. <laughs> um, you don't know what you don't know. And I like that a lot. 
Um, I think that's the thesis of Chasing Sunrise in a bit. That's Julian, who I was talking yeah. about. He works in our office. Okay. No way. Okay. <laughs> so he went to Everest with me. I'm a huge fucking fan. I don't know any of those guys. Um, I just see them from afar, and I see what they're doing, and I think it's badass. Uh, you want to have your mind blown? Have those guys in for a conversation. I actually reached out to them <clears throat> well, a couple of days go ago. Go tomorrow to work and tell them to come yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> I literally I reached out to them. Uh, someone did. Someone did a live a live stream, and I popped on there, and I just had like I had like 18 back and forth with them, answering questions and stuff. And I was like, "This guy's fucking awesome," and uh, I know the whole team's great, and I want to actually have them all in here uh, at some point just to further that conversation because I I think what they're doing is completely unique and it's not bullshit. And there's so many people out there that do do bullshit. I'll tell you one thing <clears throat> about those two guys because technically it's it's really like Julian. Is this three? And, uh, Julian and Gordon. Are the two main Isn't founders? Isn't there a uh, uh, girl as well? Uh, there's people that come in and help with certain aspects. Okay, I don't of know what I'm talking about. Sure, but um, they to live a judgment-free life, to not to meet someone, not judge instantly, mm-hmm. to be to be so free of that, is what those guys harness, mm. and especially Gordon. Gordon is gifted beyond anyone I've ever met with the ability to sit, listen, and never pass judgment. You feel safe. Julian, <clears throat> his brain goes 8 million miles an hour. Mm-hmm. And his ability is to somehow categorize it, silo it, and execute on it. And if you don't know those guys, you think, how does this even make sense? How does their relationship? But they are so categorically and analytically intelligent that they've figured out how to take such polar opposites and create what they've done. And what they're working on right now is that nobody knows about is absolutely amazing. I'm, I'm so fortunate to have gotten to go to Nepal with those two guys. Mm-hmm. Um, I am really excited to work with those guys as well. And it's, it's cool because they are very unique. Like if there's one thing I could say that you can learn, anybody can learn from those two guys. It's, the ability to not pass judgment. To be mm. able to sit in a room regardless of how long you've known them within seconds and feel judgment free mm. is, could you imagine? Like yeah. how good could the that freedom. possibly feel? Yeah. And that's what they do. It's like they're two little Buddhist monks. <laughs> <laughs> two little Buddhist monks sitting there <laughs> exactly. taking people to... So I highly recommend that you have them on. Absolutely. I'd, I'd love to. And uh, we'll, we'll try to make that happen as soon as possible. But you so see, you went to Nepal with them. They also did the coolest New Year's thing ever. Yeah, Sit Like, what the f- in hell? That's re- <laughs> so cool. I was so mad. Oh, man. Don't get me started. <laughs> no, I, I'm infuriated that i didn't that i didn't go but um so they took a group of 60 six what 60 people to marrakesh to morocco 60 yeah damn son okay all right um i was gonna say 16 or something like that 30 30 of us went to nepal right and 60 went to marrakesh that's unreal so the uh, new year's is a big thing for me i don't like to celebrate it I'm not a cel- I don't do birthdays. I don't celebrate. Like I'm, I'm bad like that. And uh, part of, I want to talk to you about uh, ex- create, execute, celebrate. I'm really curious about that actually because mm-hmm. there, there's a lot there. We'll get back to that. We'll circle back. But every New Year's, I'm like, we're either at a point collectively as a team, and I mean, you know, my inner circle of you know four or five friends, and I mean the team itself fired, and I mean the team of advisors that I work with at, at work. We're either at a point. Where we can go and 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 go to where do they go? What's the name? Marrakesh. Marrakesh. Morocco. 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 Yeah, go to Morocco and and hike the freaking desert on New Year's, or go to Switzerland and rent out a castle, or we're nowhere at all. Let's just keep working, and that's that's always been my and I I know there's pitfalls to that, and but that's always been my thing. I can't sit there and celebrate on New Year's when I, when why are we celebrating time? You know, like I get it, you know, but I, and that's a different conversation what they were able to do with that group of people and take them to such a spectacular place and orchestrate it so beautifully. And there's one thing to orchestrate it. And I've heard it from around the community that that, that trip was awesome. And obviously it was, mm-hmm. but then to, pers- to um, show that digitally and storytell the way they did, <laughs> that was so cool. Yeah, Julian's a freak on Instagram. I'm in awe. Sure. Not yeah. even like on Instagram, on their website, on yeah. the blog post, everything, flawless. Yeah, where, no, that's got, true. where do you learn his stuff? I'm going to ask him the same question, but where do you learn his stuff? How do you get that vision? Um, you know, what's funny is uh, a couple of years ago, I started a, 
I want to do a podcast kind of thing called the Aspirers. Okay. And I interviewed them. They were my first interview. And I couldn't get an answer out of them. That's the one thing you'll notice with these guys is you'll never get like a, what color is that water bottle? It'll never just be green. And they're getting better at that because <laughs> they realize in business you have to be able do, to get to an noted. answer. How do you make your revenue? Well, <laughs> exactly. Uh... That question, that was one of my questions. And, mm. you know, uh, I think what they've done is they've learned instead of focusing on the financial aspect of things, they focused on the human element. And they get caught up in the other side of it too. But when you're focusing on the human element of any experience, mm -hmm. you also just have to put yourself into perspective and say, what do I want? And sometimes what you want is probably also what a lot of other people are sharing. Of course. And I think that's what they did is they said, well, okay, what's the human element? What do I want to make as pure and transparent as possible? And then they just spent that time playing around on digital, the digital platforms to do it. They've got... I love working with those guys because there's lots of opportunities within their business that they don't see that my I see and vice versa. Of course. And that's what's really great is to have that synergy between the two companies and be able to say like, what about this? What about that? And the way those guys think is really helpful because that's what they're really focused on is the human element. Mm -hmm. Like how do you make – we're really caught up in you're 22, you're focused on your business and you, like you said, you made a bunch of money this and, and how easy it is to get caught up on that. Oh, my God. And their whole thing is like we weren't born to pay bills and die. Yeah. No. Right. It's it's there's a human element of coming back to celebrating and stuff, but it's the human element of existing in the present, and that's what they made their focus. And they did that. They also continue to do that through their social, because mm -hmm. when you look at their social, you kind of almost are like existing with them. They spend the time to write thought provoking stuff, and sometimes it's over the top. You're like, enough already. Who? <laughs> I've seen enough of this shit for the day, and yeah. they get it. But it's it's that's it's. Trial and error, and it's it's their foundation is we drive the human element. Yeah, it's their method of storytelling is just it's, so awesome. Yeah, it's uh, I don't that is an art in itself. Very much so. I don't know. Yeah, beautiful, totally beautiful. Um, create, execute, celebrate. Cool. What does it mean? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. going back to you being an athlete, when you did something great in sport or you you worked really hard on a project of course and your goal is to get that project done half the time we're so focused on just getting it done and then as soon as we're done we move on to the next thing what value did that have and sadly it's as simple as to-do lists nowadays i celebrate a to-do list being finished at the end of the day it feels so good to sit there at the end of the day, cross off that final lit line on the to-do list, make my zero my inbox a zero inbox, and sit there at the end of the day and go, and take like five minutes to think about, like, I did all of that today. Yeah. Because if you don't celebrate the small victories, life blends to become a monotonous continuation of the day before. And when you just add a little celebration, and that doesn't mean much. It just means acknowledging mm -hmm. a change or a completion of something it really does give you a sense of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. So create is, is when, you know, it's easy to have an idea. Create that idea. Bring up that context. Whatever it may be that you want to do, create it. Mm -hmm. If you design this water bottle, great. You designed it, you've put it together, but the next step is executing on it. How do you bring it to market? And then once you've done that, if one person, one person buys your water bottle, celebrate it. And set those benchmarks, but then you have to celebrate it. You have to take ten. You have to take that ten minute break and go outside, and look at the North Shore Mountains and be like, "Fuck yeah!" Wow, yeah. And then go back in, and it's as simple as that. And it does make you remember those those mile way, those milestones. You said you don't celebrate New Year's and your birthdays, and and I'm with you. Like I, New Year's to me is another day. But you saying that and the way you said it gave me perspective to say, well, you know what? Maybe I should look at celebrating New Year's because what is it? It's a forced societal opportunity to actually engage with great people. And yeah. there's only so many of those in a year. So if there's, if I didn't call it New Year's, but I called it uh, a new day. So instead of it being Sunday, it's like blah day. Yeah. And it's a brand new day. It only happens once a year, but it's a day that happens once a year. Mm -hmm. Would you celebrate it? It's just this concept of New Year's, turning leaf, resolutions, it puts an onus on it that's not necessary. Right. It can be whatever you want it to be. And what's the greatest thing is, is that everything's shut down. 
So it gives everybody less excuses to not participate in something mm -hmm. and opens up the door for people to participate in more. Mm -hmm. Be that going to Marrakesh. Mm. Be that just meeting a friend because they don't have to work the next day and having a coffee. Yeah, That's where it's valuable. And that's where it's like a birthday is another thing. It's like, you know, you're what milestone birthdays do you really remember? You're like, well, 17 turning 18 was pretty dope in Alberta, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 20 turning 21 in the States is pretty big. Yeah. But aside from that, like what, you know, and then people turning 50 is a big one. And, you know, people turning 60 because then it's all of a sudden seniors discounts. But aside from that, like, you know what? <laughs> it's really perspective again. It's like, what do you want that data to mean for you? And it mm -hmm. doesn't need to be a cake and a surprise, but it can just be you saying, I lived another year of my life and I accomplished this. I did this. Stop looking at the negatives, but think about the positives. What can I pull from this? What do I want to challenge myself for the next 365 days as I go around the sun? Hmm. And that's what I mean by celebrate. You don't have to party. You don't have to get drunk. You don't have to do drugs. It's just literally taking a moment to acknowledge something you've accomplished yeah. or done or tried or failed at. That's a big one. <sighs> Talking to guys that more failed businesses than most people. Yeah. <laughs> Than most entrepreneurs or, or whatever. Most mm -hmm. people never even had a business, never took that jump. Exactly. I, uh, man, I'm, I'm really torn. I'm super torn on it. I think celebration of life is an amazing thing. Uh, simply being alive is awesome. I mean, Gary Vee says it, four trillion to one is your odds of being a human, all that stuff. And it's very true. Um, I have a tendency when there's a societal norm to just automatically say no. You know, like I'm the type of guy, like my dad raised me in a way where it's like, you know, give a gift every day. Don't give a gift on a birthday. Give a gift every day or give it you Agreed. Know, once Valentine a week. should be every day. It's, it's like, why is, why, like if you give someone a gift, like why are you giving it? Because you're fucking, because you deserve it. You know what I mean? Like period. I don't care what it says on the calendar, right? That has nothing right? to do with acknowledgement. That has to do with consumerism. Exactly. And so th those... That's why I have a problem with so many holidays, right? Like Christmas, I got a problem with it. You know what I mean? Like birthdays, I got a problem with it. What is the underlying tone that you do like in those things? Like I said, for me, Christmas is an opportunity for me to go see my family. We don't give presents. Yeah. I don't actually, we put a Christmas tree up, but I don't even think I sat by it this year. You go, uh, we go watch a <laughs> movie on, together. Mark. Yeah. <laughs> we go watch a movie together. I go to the gym that I grew up going to. Yeah. Like that's what Christmas is for me. It has nothing to do with St. Nick. It has nothing to do with presents. It has nothing to do with Christmas food. It has to do with the fact that society has shut down for five days and it's okay for me to leave my job yeah. and go and do it because nobody else is working. I almost think that like nowadays with the way that society's progressed, forget what the, what the point of the holiday is. Look at it as an opportunity to connect. I like that. That's it. I like that a lot. And you'll find a lot more happiness because the bullshit of the consumerism that's put on us Watching the sales, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Monday. Uh, Boxing Day, sale, 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 has made me hate shopping. Yeah. Because I'm either going to get ripped off before the day, ripped off after they miss the day, yeah. miss something, fuck it. <laughs> Instead, why don't I take advantage of the fact that it's a forced holiday for everyone? Yeah. And it's opened up the opportunity to connect with someone because it's okay. Yeah, because I'm not missing anything because everyone else is forced to take it off. That's a great way to look at it. Do you look at New Year's the same way? How do you celebrate New Year's? How did you celebrate New Year's? Let me ask you that. I actually flew home from Vegas um, <laughs> New Year's Eve, and I was in bed. I watched a movie. And it was chill. It was just it allowed me to take because New Year's was on a Monday, so I think so it was Tuesday. So yep. I took I took Tuesday off, yeah. and I was like, you know what? Nobody else is working. Why not? So to me, that's what it was. Usually, typically, I go ski touring. I go into the backcountry on Tuesday. Sweet. Because most people are hungover, and it's quiet out there. Yeah. And for me, it's a great day to reset. As for, you know, New Year's is a lot of times from my industry, like with marketing, and is a, it's a kind of a scary time for us. Yeah. Like Christmas is great. You got to market. You get busy for Christmas. But when you get to New Year's, you're, you're always worried because you're like, what's next? Like it's quite a gap before the next big push in marketing, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Where's my next dollar coming from? So, hmm. um, you know, spring marketing campaigns and the shifts in fashion lines. And so it's a bit of a different scenario. So, yeah, it's a weird spot. I, I totally get it. It's a, almost a blank. When's your next big push? Totally. Like magazines are spring, summer. Like you're not, nobody's like January to yeah, February. No one, it's kind of a weird month. For yeah, everything. it's odd. So. For sure. Um, when I initially asked, what did you go to university for? I thought you were going to say psychology. Oh. 
uh, just because of what you do day to day, how you hold yourself, the way I see you interact with people. You're very much, uh, you said it earlier, how much can you read off of a person? How much can you learn from a person, right? That's very much a psychology-esque way of approaching things, if you will, right? Understanding con consumer behavior, how, <laughs> uh, what uh, motivates people, perspective. These well, are all psychology terms. One of my favorite courses at university, I took one of the 22 faculties, was consumer psychology. Yeah. And it was actually one of my favorite courses. But uh, like I said, university for me was try everything. Yeah, which is totally. Pretty much my motto for life. <laughs> Which is the way to go. Which is the way to go. Yeah. I know. I know. I have a list. I have a list at home of shit that I want to try. I love it. My excuse is because it's like from day one of trying something to day 10, you have you get like 3,000% better. And then it's like, you know, law of diminishing returns, right? But that's just incentive to just go and try a bunch of different stuff, yeah. right? Like, why not? Totally. You're going to get so much better on your third day. Dude, like, come on, try it. Um, but I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, peeled media. Sure. First off, peeled as in layers as in layers of an onion? I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know idea. Oh, actually, okay, so it's kind of funny. Um, so weird chain of events kind of led to it, but uh, how do I? Okay. In 2006, <laughs> I moved to Victoria. In 2009, I took over a gym called Bodhi. Okay. And turned it into Catalyst in 2000. And where, sorry, we're in Victoria. I'm, I'm my bad. I'm yeah, interrupting you. No, 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 it's all good. Um, Fort Street. Yeah. Uh, do you know where that mosaic building is? Yeah. yeah. That building, I was the whole ground floor. It was called Bodhi. Then it became Catalyst, which was mine. Right beside like Fort Street Cycle. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Across the street from Moksha. Yeah. Now it's a eyeglass shop. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, so 2009. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So 2009 started Catalyst. In 2016, 2015 or 14. 14, I started Catalyst 2.0, which was over on the waterfront. You were in the gym for this long? I was in the gym Fuck. business for 10 years, and um, I knew I wanted to own a gym when I was 13. I knew the yeah. name. I knew what color it was going to be. I knew everything. I knew exactly the equipment it would be. I knew wow. the style. Um, gyms suck. Gyms are a horrible industry to be in. <laughs> I totally agree, but um, tell me why. We'll get, Actually, that. We'll get back get to that. that. <laughs> we'll get back to that. Uh, well, it's super simple. The amount of floor space required, they need to be in high traffic areas. Yeah. Your equipment's depreciates very quickly uh it's crazy to think that a steel bar which is depreciate steel is depreciate but it does um it's a volume business unfortunately my philosophy was about education we wanted our facilities to educate we didn't care if you walked away fitter we didn't care if you walked away that wasn't our priority obviously we cared but it was our philosophy was educated we wanted you to come in there any questions we wanted to figure out a solution or an answer um we were voted one of the top 11 fitness facilities in North America. Wow. Which is amazing because I was on the same piece of paper as Equinox, which is who Crazy. I modeled myself after. Wow. Um, I won a top business business to watch award, which was pretty cool. And I think I lost almost half a million dollars on those projects before the age of 28. And I paid back all my original investors. But it was, it was an amazing experience because what I learned was I don't want to be a CEO. I want to be a CMO. I want to be a marketing guy. Hmm. I want to be an innovations guy. But I don't want to be the guy at the top making the business decision. But I want to be the guy, the guy who runs the business, comes to you and says, what do you think of this? What would your strategy be? Right. I, so I then moved to Vancouver uh, to be closer to the mountains and to be in a bigger, busier city. Yep. And I hired a life coach. And the life coach said, what's the connection between all the businesses you're doing? So well, I really liked designing the website, doing all the branding, coming up with thematics. Really, like I designed every aspect of my businesses. Hmm. She goes, but I hated running them. She goes, that's marketing. That's creativity. I used to work. I had put on one of the largest free ride mountain bike events in Whist in Victoria's history. Hmm. We had 120,000 people come down in the Inner Harbor and watch a Red Bull free ride event. Crazy. Um, when was uh, this? 2012. Hmm. It's called Jump Ship. Uh, you know, it's... At the end of the day, if I looked at everything across the board, it was all marketing related. Mm -hmm. I, was, I loved marketing. I loved the psychology of it. I loved the strategy of it. So fast forward to... Uh, Wait, hold on. What was that Red Bull? What was, sorry, what was a Red Bull event? It was called Jump, Jump Ship. Ship. Yeah. So what happened? We brought three barges into the Inner Harbor and built a massive free ride jump course on it. That's from fucking sick. Yeah, it was wild. And I got 
the first year they brought me in and they're like, you have six weeks because they were struggling. Can you raise $120,000? Somehow I fucking did it. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next year, um, that year we at least made money or broke even. The next year we did it, we lost 50 grand, but that was because of how big we pushed it, but it was okay to lose money per se. Yeah. And, um, because it was an event we couldn't charge for. We were using public land, so we totally. couldn't charge. Had we been able to charge, like basic totally access, different. Yeah. totally different game. Yeah. And uh, but it was a huge success, and it was it was an amazing thing for Victoria. It was an amazing thing for us at That's that age. That's so cool. Was there any, is there any video? Can we Google some? Yeah, it's on. I, you'll, unfortunately, I don't know where the real pro versions, but there's lots of like cell phone videos of stuff. And All right, try to find something cool, Brady. That's super. Yeah, it's called that's Jump super Ship Victoria, BC. But um, but it taught me a lot, and so. Everything just linked together, right? The coach is like, what, is, what, what do you see? I was like, I love the creating side. So moved to Vancouver, got a really cool opportunity. I was on a reality show. That was really Timber fun. Creek. Timber Creek Lodge. Yeah. Um, got a glimpse of the entertainment industry. Really got to see how the behind the scenes works because the reality show is literally behind the scenes as it's happening. Right. And, um, and again, reinforced that. So last year, I met a guy named Mike through my roommate. And they were filming vlogs together. And I was like, this guy's really talented at editing. Like, I'd love to work with him to do some stuff. And we just started working together. And okay, oh cool, this might be. Is this Whist it? No, that's Whistler. This nope. is some other shit. That's something different. Jump shit, Victoria, BC. Uh, yeah, those. That's it. What? How? Yeah. So, are you kidding? Yeah, that yellow car was mine. <laughs> <laughs> So like all of the, yeah, these are, you had them, walk them these up? are the same guys that ride jump sh or uh free ride. Uh, what the hell is it called? Crankworks and Whistler. Crankworks. Yeah. yeah. Sweet. So there we built a barge then this goes from land to, to the sea. Ah. They, yeah. It was pretty crazy. So what? I was in charge of all the marketing and partnerships and right. Um, yeah, really neat. Like just a crazy event to do. And we like, we battled everything from rainstorms to windstorms to guys getting injured this is so sweet. Oh my god! Yeah, I totally know the, the the skyline too. Yeah, there's the Delta Hotel right there. Yeah, yeah. So that was pretty pretty cool experience. Wow. Does cool stuff like this still happen in Victoria? I swear I'm, to God, I'm I don't sure see it does. It. Like this was kind of one of a kind. Well, two of a kind. Um, two of a kind. Yeah. The problem is they built out the you know where the harbor jets come in. Yeah. So they yeah. built that out. So now that's where the barges were. So it oh, okay, it wouldn't work. Okay. There's logistically it just it didn't have the money. And right in front of a government. Yeah. like that has to, oh i don't know so tourism want... victoria was a massive sponsor of it and um sia uh they actually they were a client of mine through the gym this is what i talk about like knowing people is so insanely valuable so one hundred twenty thousand dollars in six weeks was predominantly to pay for all this stuff but it also came through the same contractor okay. so like sia south island aggregates they brought in the dirt they brought in the activators they did all of it for us wow which is why this was able like we would never have been able to do this if it wasn't for companies like that totally and like they're not getting any like nobody's gonna be like oh i saw your sia banner there i'm gonna go buy some dirt from you like nobody who's watching this is thinking that maybe the dump like the riders are yeah but but it's just cool like you you never know where your dollars are going to come from anthem properties which is a vancouver based company they okay. were one of the sponsors there too wild so we did all the preliminary marketing for it and super cool man that's amazing so sorry let's 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 hop back there so yeah you, so uh mike yeah so i met mike and Sometimes you just come across people where it works, where your working relationship works. And yep. I'm a visionary, so I can see a picture of how I want something to go down. I can say it to him once. I can voice it. He gets it. He films it. Done. Wow. And it's there's the coolest thing is there's no ego in play. Yeah. My, it's a vision. It's not concrete. So it needs to be adapted. Mm -hmm. And when he's got a camera, he only has my vision through his mind. That he has to do. So if I say that was a shitty take, he's not hurt. Yeah. He recognizes like, there's it was a, a reason take. I'm saying that. Yeah, yeah. And if he thinks it was a good take, he'll justify it. I'll listen and I'll probably agree. But yeah. it rarely ever comes to that part because we trust each other's. And if not, we'll go back after and reflect. So we started working together on smaller projects and then project led into project. And then eventually I said, screw it. Let's, let's get our studio. Let's not be a coffee shop company. And let's see what we can do. And we started this in June last year. We're at a hundred and probably just shy of two hundred thousand in revenues in six months. How did? It... And yeah, it's. Uh, I still <laughs> okay, made a okay. dollar. <laughs> okay, shut the fuck up for a second. Jesus Christ, June, June yeah. last year. Mm -hmm. Or sorry, two years ago now. Nope. 
June? Six months ago. Yep. Okay, um, let's just... Um, <laughs> Okay. So our goal this year is to finish off. I'd like to hit two hundred fifty thousand, which shouldn't shouldn't be that hard. We should be able to do it. But I'd like to go two fifty, get to a staff of five in the next year, a million dollars next year. You started a digital media agency. We're essentially a marketing and production agency. So right. So you create content and find a way to market to consumer. So this is what we wanted to be was just a content creation agency. So you'd come to us and be like, hey, we need to film this video, and it's about X. Perfect. Done. So essentially, I'd be a director and Mike would be a videographer. What has happened is that when a company comes to us and we create a piece for them, it doesn't. it's better than the quality of their website or it's better than their social media. So now we have to turn around and we go, okay, well, why don't we redesign your website? We'll redesign your social media. We'll come up with your year strategy and then we'll make the content for it. So we've become one of those newly adapted agencies, which is a marketing agency focus heavily on strategy, and then we can create all our content. And most of the time, there's a huge disconnect between, if you're on a commercial, I shot a commercial a couple years ago for Lexus. I was, uh, I guess, an actor in it. There was the client, so which is Lexus, who hired a marketing agency, who then hired an advertising agency, who hired a production agency, and then a private director. Mm -hmm. To get the pair of pants that I was wearing, the decision took almost an hour and a half because it had to go through all those people. In our situation, it goes to our house because we're now the marketing department for a company. Mm -hmm. And then when we're producing, we already know what we're doing because we came up with the concept. We know the strategy. We know the placement. The other thing is, Chip Wilson reference again, is vertical integration. Instead of having a horizontal plane that we have to travel along, we're vertical. So if we're producing content, I also know where the content's going to go. If I'm going to shoot a web piece, but I can also cut it for Instagram, but I can also make it work on Facebook, I can also use it as a still asset here, I can also use it as a print asset down the road and a trade show booth, I can do it in one day. Most times that would be eight or nine shoot days, which is eight or nine times the price. That's how we, that's how we produce this podcast. Um, I, 100%. <laughs> yeah, it, what, it, what, vertical what, what, vertical yeah. integration. Um, I want you to dive into real quick. There's a term, um, vertical integration. The people that haven't gone to, I mean, listen, man, I got a lot of education. I did one year of business school, so, you know, <laughs> I'm really in here. Um, but there's a lot of people don't actually know what that term means. And it gets tossed a lot around, especially with entrepreneurs They're like, oh, we're going to be vertically integrated. You don't even know what that means. Well, how do you, in your, give an example of your business and what actual vertical integration means and what that can mean for other businesses? Sure. Okay. So this is, this is kind of the direction I was hoping this would go. So this is good. If we look at typical vertical integration in the Lululemon sense, went from he owned the manufacturing practices to the wholesale practices. Well, sorry, he didn't have wholesale. So manufacturing to store. So there was no middlemen. There was no other players. Yeah. He created the product. They had their uh, headquarters, and then they had their shops. So that's vertical integration, like design, yeah. advertising, marketing. Everything is done in-house. Yeah. By doing so, you cut out distribution. You cut out all these other issues that increase the costs or decrease your margins. Yeah. What I mean by vertical integration in our place is that when we come when a company comes to us, we can do all of the non-visual aspects, so your marketing and your strategy. So marketing is about strategy. Yeah. It's about long-term strategy nowadays more than it's ever been. Okay. Because a brand takes a long time to get its voice. As much as there's you you started this, so this is going to go somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you're playing you're putting it on me. You started this conversation, you bastard. <laughs> 25 years ago, okay. there were two mediums, maybe three. There was television. Print. Print yeah. and radio. Sure. 25 years ago. Websites didn't exist, right? So if you were an advertising agency, you put 6 to 10% of your revenues into marketing. So if you're a million-dollar business and you're doing a million dollars in revenue, you're putting $100,000 at the most into marketing for three platforms. Go forward 20, let's go forward 15 years, all of a sudden web comes. What right. became the biggest thing? So now all of a sudden you have to put it on your website. Okay, so now you've just got four. Website, remember how big websites had to be? They had to do everything. They had to be engaging. They had to have conversation pieces, yeah. video. Call to action. Did everything. Yeah. So, but the, the marketing budgets didn't change. It still was six to 10% of your revenues now doing four platforms. Right. Fast forward to today. Marketing budgets are still six to 10%. But how many platforms do we go to? At least websites are now becoming simpler, right? Now they're just the house. They house the information. That's it. 
They don't have to have a personality. They don't have to be engaging. They just have to literally be like, how quick can I get my information done? But now you have Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, House, Pinterest, and the list goes on. Then you also have what, um, television. You've got radio. Now all of a sudden you've got Spotify. So you've got all these different platforms that didn't exist before with the same budget. I.e. podcast. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Of 6 to 10%. Mm -hmm. So imagine being a marketing company. And this is why the big guys like DDB, Taxi, these big agencies are struggling. Is we're going, okay, there's the, there's the four of us right now. 25 years ago, we have $100,000 to work with. I can pay you each $25,000 to work this many hours and do this. That budget's still the same. Now I need you guys to do 25 times, 25 times the amount of work yeah. for the same budget. Yeah. Because without vertical integration and without understanding the long-term strategy, you're going to be blowing your money on content creation because everything can fit to a certain piece if thought out in advance. And that's one of the biggest issues with the industry right now is like that hasn't been thought about really. It's like the marketing budgets we have haven't really increased, but where we have to pull them, we have to stretch them 8 to 10 to 20 percent to, sorry, 8 to 10 to 200 percent yeah. further yeah. because there's now more platforms to play on. Mm -hmm. And again, like I said, fortunately, some things have simplified. Websites have simplified. Yeah. They're less about being crazy and image-based and all this stuff and having to integrate with everything. They're supposed to be the housing of information. Yeah, they're just kind of simple, accordion style. You know, you exactly. Hear, yeah. Boom. Yeah. Single pages are killers, right? That's yeah, what we want. Totally. What's Facebook? Facebook is a digital magazine. What's Instagram? Well, Instagram is two parts now. Actually, it's three. Instagram is your feed. Okay. Then you've got your fucking personality, which exists in your Insta story. And then there's Instagram TV, which no one's mastered. So, like, now we've got that platform. What's well, so new, but yeah. You've got YouTube, right? Then you've got, um, like, there's, there's, there's so many. And, like, Spotify is in an unbelievable asset because now a brand can create Spotify playlists, which showcases brands. And then you can add advertising on there. <clears throat> The marketing world, though, as ex it has become extremely extravagant, the potential is huge, but the cost, if you're not efficient and long-term strategy thinking, is it's undoable. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. And that's what's wild. So you have to be a jack of all trades in order to make this work. And so adaptable. So like I said, does Zuckerberg know what's going on? Does he, does he, does he have any? Neither do we. Right. Like, I don't have a mentor in the industry, and that's what I've been dying for. It's like, I'm going to get into this. I'm going to find a mentor. I went to a girlfriend of mine who used to be the head at DDB for female innovation. Okay. She's like, I don't have a fucking clue what's going on now. She's like, marketing isn't what it used to be. And you see it, like, look at, um, there's a shoe company you just had on, Vis Visal? Vessi Footwear. Vessi. Yeah. They did Kickstarter. Yeah. Okay. When Kickstarter started, there was one Kickstarter. Now there's like a hundred different crowdfunding ones. There's women's ones, like women only products. Yeah. There's like probably amputee version too. Like if you're missing a limb, you can raise funds. Like you never know <laughs> what. And yeah. that's the thing is like they used that platform and got their funding and they grew. There's also less barriers to entry into marketplaces now too. His product, though unique, it isn't that hard to have yeah. something to compete against it faster than ever before. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing with marketing is like, you have to be quick, efficient, but you also have to think, what's your long-term strategy? Because nowadays, you can't just rely on the quality of your product. You can't just rely on the branding of your product. You have to rely on how those things work together. Hmm. And that's what's really interesting about the way things are going. There's no mentors. There's nobody to really look at. There's nobody that has figured this out. That's why I laugh at textbooks, right? Like marketing <laughs> textbooks are hilarious. And there's, there are fundamentals to business, and I, I don't mean to shit on them. No, or no, or no, anything like that. Um, but things are so fast paced. We, uh, in many situations, in many businesses that I've been a part of, uh, small and mid cap, they have all struggled with the concept in the past two to three years of, okay, let's hire a content manager um, or a social media manager. And, and, and they'll look at me as the young person in the room and they say, <laughs> what would you suggest? And I, I'm sitting here like, I don't know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And the, the, the feedback I'll, I'll go and I'll say, listen, I, I, don't, I don't know. Yes, I interact on these platforms and I understand them, you know, a little bit more intuitively than you might. This 60 year old balding white guy, and you know, because you know a different game. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I'll say, listen, nobody knows it. I think you just need to hire the person that can execute and pivot the fastest and is willing to learn at such a rapid pace 
faster than the next guy. And whoever you can figure out to pivot and move and learn quicker than the next guy, I just think that's going to be your guy. I don't think there necessarily has to be a knowledge base. There's, you're, you're right. There's no, there's no way to prove that one strategy is right and one strategy is wrong until you've done it and it doesn't work. So right. like in advance, like just because you tried something on social platforms, whatever it may be, doesn't mean it won't work for another brand because the way their voice is, the way that their whole package is created, it might work. We had, um, this comes back down to process efficiencies and inefficiencies. What I mean by that is um, we were approached by a company recently and they're like, we want to do this and we want to do this and we want to do this. And we're like, here's a quote. It's going to be big yeah. because right now you have too many options. They're trying to, they're trying to make something for everyone. Okay. I was like, but you haven't mastered your back end. So like the, for me to get, if I'm ordering this cup, yes. how many clicks should it take me to order that cup from the second I land on your page? Maximum three. Oh yeah, I was going to say two, yeah. Yeah, like coffee cup, name, pay. That's it. Done. Yeah. And nowadays, most of your information is already there, so it should just be select, pay. And then if you have any things you want to add. So yeah. we're saying like three. How many times, if I order this every Monday, at the same time, should I have to think about this? Should, the, should like that be something I do anymore? You don't really need to. Yeah, the information's yeah. there. The information's there. Yeah. And now with machine learning, that should be happening automatically. Like, hello, Mark, your coffee's ready at Starbucks at 8 a.m. And that should come through my Google Home. Yeah. Or it should come through whatever. What's interesting is when we, this company approached us, I said, I can't market you. I can't do anything for you until the process efficiencies and inefficiencies are fixed. I.e., from the second someone gets there, from the first time they see you, to the second they finish their process of trying to get the product, mm -hmm. that is so streamlined that there's no reason they would leave. Because if that's a failure, the marketing's gonna be amazing, and then it's just gonna fail anyway. So it's gonna, you're gonna blame the marketing on failing. And if as a marketing company, I wanna be able to advertise, hey, from the second you arrive on this page, it's amazing. This, the process of ordering is amazing. Getting it's amazing. Guess what, the product's amazing. Like, I don't wanna be like, trust us. Yeah, the, well, the product's really good, good if you get to it. Yeah, if it shows up, and because your process efficiencies and efficiencies aren't there, totally. And it's it's it is probably more important that that's there so that marketing can do its job, and that's what we're again with companies we're getting into hiring us to do marketing. All of a sudden, we're going. Wait a minute. Wait, we not yet. You're yeah. not there yet. Yeah, hire us in six months. Would you figure your stuff out? Or we, well, a lot of times it's, it has to be a synergy. Like as we're figuring this out, it helps us more. Oh, right. It helps us figure out the strategy we're going to use because as we figure out that if that process through the through us learning the process, right, we can also adapt our marketing. Right. So and then through that, if you if you uh, approach a, a company that has that issue, that uh, back office issue, if you will, back office maybe a bad word, then mm -hmm. you add a value add to your business so maybe you become even a little bit more like consultants in a way right to the whole to the business as a whole ironically it was funny i went in that you said that i went into facebook today and i guess when we first set up our facebook page you can tag what kind of business you're in and the only one that was tagged was consultant <laughs> you're so like that's yeah. really bizarre i yeah. didn't put that should have put a content creator i'd be doing that more now yeah that's very interesting i think uh the the analogy that comes to my head is the artist analogy where your actual music is not good enough to be marketed and you're worrying about marketing when you shouldn't it's so i have to go to buy Sorry, your cd hold on, hold on, hold yeah on. go ahead you just i just want to understand you yeah. said your music isn't good enough to be marketed right so go back again sure your, <laughs> your music isn't there's two parts to that number one is you haven't worked on your craft enough to actually even think about marketing yet. So just just go back and make sure your processes are 100% before you even think about marketing. The yeah. second point is you're you're not readily available to be marketed. So for instance, yeah, I can market someone to go down. Like I can try to get a call to action to get a body to Safeway to buy your CD, yeah. but that's not going to do jack for you. Right, you know okay. what I'm saying? Yeah. There's kind of two, two ways to look at that. That's the analogy that goes into my head. Um, I'll argue the first point because I don't think it matters how good you are anymore. Like music, the music industry, and from a production point of view, <clears> even <throat> film, television, it doesn't content? matter. Content, from content in general, oh, doesn't really matter how good it is. Listen, okay, I agree. I agree. Sadly. And, and I'm saying this with yeah. deep sadness. I know, <laughs> because you love to create beautiful content, right? And I would prefer to watch good content too. Totally, totally, totally. So um, 
what's it uh doc uh documentation over fuck what's that saying it's a gary v thing oh my gosh there's so many of them just document document quickly and don't worry about the, the quality of it because just it, get as many ad bats con, con, as possible content over quality content over quality that's what it was super 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 simple words um and so I think that's definitely coming in. From my point of view, I hate that because I, like the the reason why I gravitated to, towards self hired a year ago because I was like, well, who's the best in, in terms of uh, small and executing at a high level? And now, if I'm a person that wants to find that company now, I'm like, ah, there's a lot of companies that are just kind of doing okay content, but they're moving very quickly. So it becomes hard for me to to pick out the right people. And it, but that's a different conversation. I I want it, I want the content to be great because I love great content and I come from the school of thought, the Nike school of thought, where it's like everything you put out needs to be branded perfectly and executed on the highest level. Don't put out shit, right? That becomes a reflection. Everything we touch as a brand needs to turn to gold, right? And that's, that's conflicting thought in a way. Am I wrong? I'm just absorbing. Right. <sighs> like for it's, instance, go ahead. Nike, Adidas, Reebok, Under Armour. Those players aren't putting out random shitty content. They've never dropped their content standards to just put shit out. They may put out more, but the quality is still good. Right. That's the cool thing. There's still a story. There's still a tone. There's still a vibe. There's a brand. There's a there's a there's a meaning to every piece that comes out. Yep. Gary V's mentality of create content, regardless of quality, is old now, in my opinion. God. Because your time, we started our conversation today about this. Is the only thing you can't get back is your time. Right. If you're focusing on celebrating your time, you're not going to waste it on shitty content. The other thing that's really frustrating, and I guarantee you everyone goes through this, is when you Netflix and chill, what percentage of time is spent figuring out what to Netflix and going through the amount of shit that's on there, starting something, realizing it's shit, and then going back? Because the content's bad. Because now they're just a content generation business. Hmm. When you find good content, you stay there. Yeah. You watch it again. If every company that we work with, we kind of say it's like we understand that you can you have to create content, but it doesn't have to be the same style of content. And so for instance, today we met with a young girl, she's wicked. And we said, let's create micro vlogs where instead of it being 20 minutes of your day where like we spoke about, I don't care how you got to the gym. I don't yeah. care about how you got your coffee and what you put in it. I want to know what your workout's about. So why don't we start when you get to the gym, meeting your friend, posting the workout, you working out, done. Two minutes. Give me two minutes of really good content that I can per pull something from, learn something from, be inspired from in two minutes. Because there's 18 other minutes that I could do that nine more times with. And I could walk away with nine times that much more information and be inspired Versus sitting there going, cool, she takes the bus. <laughs> nice, she takes sugar in her coffee. Like, yeah. And that's where I'm saying is like, so much of the content that's going out there is filler content that's literally fogging up, clouding up the airwaves instead. And so what we said is, you know what? Let's create those two minute ones that are really powerful, but then do some self blogging where you're walking around just holding your camera, but then still have a little bit of purpose. So it's intermingled in there where occasionally you're doing your Insta stories like, ah, I'm just with my friends and mm -hmm. cheers. Cool. It gives you a personality. It's not so procured. It's not so, it's not manicured. It's not procured. It's not, it's not finite. Mm -hmm. It's real. Mm -hmm. But then also recognize like, what is your purpose? And if you're a person, like in this person's in situation, it was, let's create something with every time somebody watches that two minutes, if they're going to dedicate two minutes to you, they're getting something out of it. That's good content. And that's content that you can do frequently. Okay, hold on. So you said Gary V's theory of quick rapid fire is kind of changed now to, yes, quick rapid fire. Don't do the long produced pieces of content. Do short quality. I'm, the, I'm just thinking that every piece has to have a purpose. Got you. Creating what he's saying there isn't purpose based. If Sure, create as much content as you want if it has purpose. But Showing people how you got to the gym on a bus doesn't have purpose. That segment of a minute and a half of you rambling on about absolutely nothing 
It's bullshit. It's bullshit. Yeah. So fill it. Like, cut it. Like, it doesn't need to be 20 minutes. Like, I know people love Joe Rogan. Mm-hmm. And I understand why they're three hours in length. Because sometimes it takes two hours and 45 minutes to get to the guy comfortable enough to speak his mind. Totally. But then cut to the two hours and 45 minutes. Because yeah. there's lots of times where that two hours is absolute background mind-numbing yeah. bullshit. Yeah, totally. And I, if you have that time, if you're on a long drive, then great. Give them the option to watch that. Mm-hmm. But market the substance. Mm-hmm. Let that stuff exist, but market the substance. Totally. We, we might get a thousand listens on a popular podcast. That's like up. Maybe we'll get like maybe 500 or something like that. Like, yeah. and, we're, and we're like, wow. But like we'll get our one minute clips and three minute clips and two minute clips that we chop up that Brianna's writing notes down for right now to chop up so Kev can flip mm-hmm. in the background. Like those pieces of content hit so hard and continually, continually give value. And it's almost like the podcast itself is just like a monument where you're like paying homage to it. Like, yeah, this is where we got this from. But like, you don't really have to watch that. It's, it's a gathering piece. Totally. It's a content gathering piece. Yeah. And that's why I said, is like, if I was to film you for a day, but how much would I really care about? And do people care about different things. Maybe someone really likes to watch people riding buses. Great. But that's not going to be that person's primary. It's your purpose. Right. And it comes down to what is your purpose of your content. And for every single brand, that's our thing is we go in, we started asking this question, what's your goal? And I hated that question because you know what? What's your purpose? What is your brand's purpose? If you're a butcher brew and you're a kombucha company, what's your purpose? Like, what, do you, what is your purpose of your product? Why are you marketing it this way? And what I said is, butcher brew in our, is one of our good clients. It's a representation of who she is. She's a mom, single mom of two. She's a badass. She goes out ski touring. She's a mountain biker. She's taking this business and growing it from Nothing to a million dollars in revenue in like three years. Wow. She's got full canning line, full everything. And yeah, she has some support. But what does it represent? It represents, represents the be ambitious mentality. And her slogan that we came up with was be ambitious, be you, butcher brew. And the whole concept is drink a beverage. Let's go. The whole marketing plan behind it is your life is dope. Regardless if you're sad or happy, just take us with you. We want to support your life. We want to be a part of your life. Mm-hmm. We're not judging you. It's just we want to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. And we've ridden, we've, we've driven that and that's what we're going with. And it's, it's the content we're trying to create is about that. It's about mm-hmm. embracing ambition. It's about supporting that initiative to take a chance. Mm-hmm. If your chance is that you're going to sit at home and watch Netflix, then dope. We'll, we'll hang with you. And that's, that's cool because that's the choice you just, you decided to make for yourself. That's your own journey. That's your own path. And it bring it back to content, which is, Hopefully, the content that people are creating, if it is frequent or infrequent, has a purpose and has quality. So I think Gary Vee's sentence is just missing that final segment is just create it with purpose. Don't just be like, oh, yeah, so here's me uh, drinking Tim Hortons uh, mm-hmm. and grab a phone call. Like yeah. that, that whole segment doesn't need to exist. Yeah, totally. So that's, I just wish he would rephrase that because that, that, I've heard that more than every, everybody comes to us with that. Mm. Oh, we just need to create a lot of content what type like i said from vertical integration i can take one single day we shot the butcher brew campaign it was we created six months worth of content out of one day mm-hmm. of like a lot of content that's crazy and ads we shot that commercial so we could cut them and cut them and cut them and cut them into whatever way we wanted for the same price that it would cost you to shoot one video yeah and yet we've got images and stills and everything yeah. behind the scenes and all of it came together because we vertically integrated the process to say, and what I mean by that is we started off saying, what would we need for print and how could we reverse engineer it for social? Because print is a finite amount of context. Because if you're saying you're a magazine, you only have 20 pages, you've only got 20 pages. So that's the minimum amount of printable space. Then from that 20 pages, what can I create? Hmm. And that's how we did it. And that's our content. When does the space not get foggy? There's so much shit out there right now. Fucking awesome question. Um, when people start to realize that they're equally as frustrated by the fogginess. And it's unfortunately the Logan Pauls of this world have made millions and millions of dollars off of creating absolutely useless content. 
Because people are looking for that outlet to zone out. And that's a bigger problem. <laughs> it's a bigger problem that we have to go to these things because life is so tough. Escapism. Escapism. But it's also still up to you as a user to decide what you want to escape to. If you want to escape to watching Blue Planet, amazing. If you want to escape to watching Logan Paul beat up someone, sure, that's amazing. But I don't know what you're getting to help progress <laughs> yourself no? further. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, I wouldn't talk negative about anybody's choice of content. What I would choose is what is it? How do you? What's the purpose? What's your purpose? And if you can give me a good purpose, then I support it. God, what a Canadian answer. Not to say that totally. <laughs> that is not awesome, because it is, but it just doesn't have necessarily great purpose. <laughs> it's shit, Logan. That's what he's trying to say. Um, <laughs> Agreed. Um, that's hilarious. I don't, I'm super off that whole thing. I'm like really disconnected from like Logan and all that stuff. I, yeah, like, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't want to be connected to it. <laughs> I just have to read it. I, yeah. I have to know about it. Totally. It's your job. It's your job. Um, I want to answer this question. You said, yes. how, do I de how do you know when it's going to become defogged? It's going to become defogged because people are going to start going back to humanizing again. You're going to start saying, can I Netflix and chill? Or can I finally, for the love of God, put my cell phone away and just go talk to a human being? Totally. And that's oh what's my happening. Gosh. Okay. I'm so glad you went that route. Um, I have a theory. Um, in 10 years, I want to own culture centers. So I want to own barbershops, coffee shops, movie theaters, things of that nature, right? Because I think it's going to take that long to get back there. And then the price of admission to those spots is going to skyrocket because human interaction is going to be, is going to be so suppressed. I think it's going to take a long time. The same amount of time it's going to take me to accumulate the assets to buy, them, buy those businesses and flip them. What are your thoughts? I think it's brilliant, but I don't think your prices are going to skyrocket. I think your demand will just be there. Okay. Yeah. I don't think you're going to need to worry about charging a lot because it's, everyone will want human interaction yeah i had a conversation with my google home the other day i was like good like because it, it's like hey google how are you it's like good night google i have to say good night google to get my alarm to pop up and it freaks me out and i don't like it because at the end of the day have you ever seen the movie her like yeah. it's gonna happen yeah are you gonna start dating siri like she doesn't talk back yeah. that often yeah and it's those culture centers, like you can already see it. Where do, what is a WeWork? A WeWork yeah. is a culture center. It's a totally. multi-billion dollar culture center. Totally. They're fucking geniuses. They took the people out of the coffee shops and put them into a, same, a coffee shop inside a building. Why are coffee shops, like why is everybody, we're, why is Chasing Sunrise successful? Because they recognize that we need that outlet. Why is content about connecting people engaging? Because we're dying for that ability to connect. Totally. We're not, as much as we're meant to be alone, we, we aren't. As much as we can live on our own, we grow we, together. We can't. Totally. We and can't. I think your concept of owning those things is mm. absolutely on point. Mm. A million percent. I just don't know. My thought on that is I don't know if that's going to be the most profitable. I'm sure it'll be profitable, but is it really going to be where, you know, is it scalable and, and can you really make billions doing that? I don't know. But like, for me, that's where profit and passion will try to find a, a, a space in between. And, and maybe that's a space I can operate in, 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 you know, 10 years. That's I think in 10 years, you're not going to give a shit about profit and you'll just be so happy to escape. Hopeful. Yeah. The way things are going right now to be able to unplug and just connect yeah, yeah you're not gonna care how rich you are yeah you'll be going to the places where money doesn't matter because the places where money matters are gonna be too connected mm. and you'll just want a tent in the middle of nowhere with your best friend to just wake up and not hear anything connected to beep beep or hello or good morning yeah. google like <laughs> anything but that so you ever heard of uh hornby island you ever yep. heard of that spot you ever been there mm -hmm. no way so oh, when'd you go Oh, years ago. When I was living in Victoria. No, no way. I went to all the islands. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Hornby's great. Yeah, I'm born there. What? Yeah. No way. Yeah, yeah they, that's the one with the crazy sick beach, right? Tribune Bay. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. yeah, you can make that look like Costa Rica or anywhere. It's amazing. And it's uh, BC, Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, yeah. yeah, there's a company. They make protein bars there. There's a company, Hornby. Hornby, Hornby Organic. They're so good. Ira Vet. Shout out Ira Vet if you're listening to this. <laughs> I went to the Gluten Free Expo to see you. I, I couldn't get out of a meeting until like 4 o'clock and you had some girl and, she, and then she left. And I didn't I don't know. I'm sorry, Ira. I, I missed you on that one. But um, 
Hornby Organic is epic. That whole island is is a gem. Um, and that's, for me, that's that spot. You can't get cell service there. Like maybe a bar, maybe a bar. And obviously Wi-Fi is there and stuff like that too. But that is 100% that place. And I think that spots like that that are not too far but far enough are just going to, you know, skyrocket. And I think just that general concept, I couldn't agree more with just human connectivity. I also on that, I want to move on from this, but I think that uh, employers and kids in college, just to loop this conversation all back in, are like, well, what jobs am I going to have in 10, 20, 30, 50 years? Obviously, I'll have to change employers many times. These trends are, are, are uh, evolving as we go. Algorithms and machine learning are going to replace people, robotics. I think the I'm just extremely lucky that I think the only gift I was ever given in this world was an ability to communicate on various mediums, whether that's writing, conversation, um, just simply to be able to have a genuine exchange with other humans. And that's, you know, why Kevin put me in this position, right? Uh, I don't fucking stand up to you for a second in terms of like catalog and resume, but I can sit down and have, I can have a, I can have a conversation. I know I can do that. It doesn't matter who we come and have sit in that chair. I know I can have dialogue with you. Right. Mm. So my, th- one of my theories or one of my theses is, are, is when we get to that point where yes, the uh, employment landscape has changed. The number one highest paying skill will be uh, client relationship management, not a CRM, not a software, but your personal ability to manage relationships in a genuine way and communicate in a genuine way and then double down on that. So by the time I'm 30, 50, 40, I'll be in a position to actually execute that on a high level, not in a way that makes the most money, but in the way where you're actually invested and you can, like my value, uh, perceived value and actual value because of my communication skills will have gone up so much and I'll still be able to care. And because of that, you'll be worth something. Just a thought. Empathy. Empathy. You can't teach machines empathy yet, but I hope they can. (sighs) They can teach compassion, but you can't teach empathy. There's a a company called Singularity Net um, that that does machine learning, and its concept is you can't just give a a machine a set of ethics and a code of ethics because what's ethical today was not what was ethical 60 years ago. So you have to give that a subset of a base to grow and learn off of and you have to foster it and change it like a child. And I think it's the way to go with machine learning and, and to get to put ethics into machines mm-hmm. in some way, shape, or form that can reflect our values as a society. Totally different conversation, but very, very interesting. And and I work my I work in ethical investment. That's that's totally, what yeah, yeah. we try to do. And so integrating that into our business plan and and offering that as a a solution is very very interesting and it's super um it's in its infancy now you said something here you said we started this in june (laughs) and we got away from that let me just can you walk me through when you met uh uh, mike let's say mark mark and mike how cute real tough it should be parents were super creative mark Mark and mike co (laughs) yeah Um, mark and mike marketing yeah i like it um when you when that actual that connection when the light bulb went off in your head like oh this is someone i can build with and and our sub our skill sets work well together when did that go from okay light bulb went off to launching to where you're at now to having a quarter million dollar you know revenue target how please please walk me through that and as in as great detail as you can um i mean realistically i think Every, I, I mean, I learned the greatest lesson last week. I learned the greatest lesson before that. So, like, my understanding how the industry had changed from being three variables to 100 variables, that was two weeks ago. Wow. Um, last week, I learned that. God, I'm, I, glad, I learned, we, I'm I, glad we canceled on you. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Here's, um, if, I'm going to ask you a question. If I was to say, Josh, build me a house, and that's all you had for parameters, how big would my house be? What would it be? What would it, what, when would you stop building my house? If I just said, build me my house? I wouldn't stop. Right. Like you, could, you could just keep building. You'd be like, yeah. I'm going to add a bathtub here. I'm going to build this. There's going to be a water slide. In the creative world, actually, hold on, before I get there. If you go to Future Shop or Best Buy, yeah. and, I, and, you, and you're buying a TV, what's the one question that makes you cringe? The price? What's, no. your, what's your budget? Oh, shit. Okay. Remember yeah. that question? Yeah. Like You get that, and you're like, you don't want to tell the guy, because you're like, 
if I say a thousand, he's gonna upsell me to twelve hundred. Like every time, like that fucking asshole, he's gonna upsell me. Yeah. In the creative world, the only parameter that exists is budget. I can make anything from nothing, but I need a budget. And that budget could be nothing. I have no money. Then maybe we can still do something with what you've got. Yeah. But if you don't give me a budget, oh, I'll have a full Nike campaign. We'll put a, we'll put a car in space. Yeah. You know, like yeah. anything's possible. <laughs> the biggest lesson I've learned this year is that the creative industry needs a budget. If you come to me and said, I have 5,000 bucks for this whole year to market, give me an hour with my team. And we'll see where we can do that. And if I can turn 5,000 into 25,000 next year, that makes my business go from 250 to a million. So what we've done is we've learned these lessons. We've made some huge mistakes in the first six months of operations. Massive. We, I hired a client. Uh, the scope of work that I gave her would be worth today, like 100 grand, and we charged three grand for it. Yeah. it was, we were just so happy to get a, a client. Yeah. The quality of our work still isn't where we want it to be. But we recognize that this process, it's only going to get there. And it will get there fast because we really spend the time to reflect on what we're doing. And when we started, it was, what do we want to shoot? So we started shooting the stuff we wanted to shoot. We reached out to those companies. We worked with Peak Performance to shoot their products. And then we started work realizing, like, well, we kind of want to shoot this too, and we want to shoot this. And we started realizing, at the end of the day, marketing isn't just industry-specific. Marketing is marketing. And at the base of marketing is strategy. So strategy exists in every single industry. So what we started off was a really closed mind. We want to be an adventure and lifestyle and travel. At the end of the day, if we're in marketing, we're technically in the business of strategy, which means that we can work in any industry mm -hmm. as long as we do our research. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we've been able to grow as quick as we are. Wow. And like literally tomorrow I go from a cosmetic surgeon's office meeting to butcher brew um, budget meeting. So kombucha company, plastic surgeon, uh, rubber manufacturing plant, uh, and then I have not Gore-Tex, right? No, sorry, <laughs> Gore-Tex. Um, into a plastics manufacturing plant, which is kind of similar, and then into the Vancouver Club. Oh wow! So you tell me how, where the similarity is. There isn't one. Like it, they all have rubber sh on the bottom of their shoes. Like yeah, that's it. But it's the fact that at the base of all of it is strategy, and how are we trying to get get your message across? And so that's I think why when you say. How do we get to where we're at is we're looking at putting more weighting on the strategy, less on the creative side, knowing that once the strategy is in place, that's when we weight the creative side. Wow. So it's going to be an ebbs and flow business with our team. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have two questions for you to close up, but you gave me, you gave me half an answer. You gave me a very uh, in-depth, you gave me an answer of a scholar. <laughs> and I like that answer. Cool. That's the answer I want. Okay. Now, for the listener, they want, okay, yeah, yeah. So he, he, he asked the question and he said, well, did, we changed our strategy along the way. We did this, that, and the other. What's the practical to that? Like, for instance, there's digital marketing companies that will always be stuck in the $3,000 client. And then at some point, you made that jump to the 10000 and then to the 50000 How did you make those jumps along the way? And when did they happen? I and mean, when did you get a studio, by the way, first for, uh, as well? Three months after opening. But I'm in the, I'm in, It'd be great to be down in Yale Town, but I'm in, I'm two blocks, I'm three doors down from Oppenheimer Park. I have doors, alarm systems, and everything, but I love my studio space. 14 foot ceilings. Yeah. I've got homeless guys in the back alley who you can learn from and give juxtaposition every single day to the life I live. I have some of the greatest conversations in my life with the guys back there to wow. really bring it back home of like, like a, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just knew, originally, I rented a really expensive partner, um, apartment in Gastown. And I just realized I didn't want to have meetings in my house. And so <laughs> we hmm. moved out of that really quick and I found this studio space and we built like a photorama wall so we could do all our photography because I'm partnered with a modeling agency as well. Right. So I do all of their, I'll build all the portfolios for the talent, which mm -hmm. allows me to get creative and shoot. Mm -hmm. um, did you, did you get to the point, was it a leap for you to be like, all right, now let's add this overhead? Did you push a little bit further or was it like, no, 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 we have the revenue now. Now we can actually sustain this. Let's get the space. No. Um, I, they say don't start a business unless you have three to six months in the bank. Yeah. And i am always been naive. My gyms were the top 11 fitness facilities in Canada or sorry, North America based on appearance purely because mm -hmm. I spent every dollar I could to make them look the way I wanted them to. I took what I lost like as a lesson 
and did the studio as basic as I could, knowing that I needed the money to be at least able to last us. The reason I went to the studio was I could afford, if, if I had to give up my apartment, I'd live in the studio. We have a shower there. I have a sink. I have a kitchenette. It's fine. And my business partner and I are both the same. Like we can live lean. Yeah. We recognize that our business is about living lean right now. In order to grow, like I remanufactured my life. And what I mean by that is I love skiing. It's my life. So I turned around to my sponsor and I said, you want me to, you want me to do this? I own a marketing company. Buy my ski pass this year. So support me. Instead of giving me as much gear as you do, buy my ski pass and I'll shoot more content for you. Mm -hmm. Done. Mm -hmm. There's my free skiing. I want foods, my biggest expense. So I turned around to a food company and said, I'll do your marketing for you. You feed us. Done. So now all of a sudden, what was an $8,000 a month uh, lifestyle? I'm living off of 2,500, but I'm living the exact same way because I'm just exchanging a service. And then that acts as a really good, because now I'm doing good work because I want to keep And you're eating. propelling your business. But they're propelling us because they're referring us or their yeah. people are seeing the work. So I guess, I mean... It, are we going to grow to the, the numbers I want to? I know. I, I just hired a project manager on who's going to come full time. And I believe that that's what he's going to do. He's going to build those systems. He's going to act as our CEO. And hopefully, based on what my life, my life coach slash therapist has said and, and my team, I think I don't see why we can't. And if we can't, it's fine because I'm going to leave this company with the knowledge I have and I'll go to whatever company I go to next or do whatever I do next can. with a fucking MBA the yeah. hard way. Yeah. So. Gangster. Yeah, that's gangster. We got to wrap here, but I got to ask last, last, last. I swear, mm -hmm. I swear, it's the last question. Go for it. <laughs> you're you're this person you've crafted and beat yourself into at 32 uh, through his experiences, people, businesses, yada 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 yada. What makes Mark Mark at this age? Hmm. Um. The willingness to consistently take risks, to find opportunities, and to take care of the people around me. Hmm. I, I learned a lot on my trip to Nepal with my mom. Um, I'm more nervous about my parents' health than I've ever been, though they're the healthiest people ever. It's just I don't want to lose that time. And the biggest thing I've, I think that where I'm at is that money means fucking nothing. <laughs> people are chasing money. I'll chase an experience any day. Wow. I'd rather get up, get paid shit, go to a job I love, be challenged emotionally, be challenged mentally, and come home. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes Mark Mark. Beautiful. Well, Mark, thank you for giving us your most valuable asset time. So I really appreciate that. And this is a uh, this conversation that we could we could I could push this to four hours easily. Um, <laughs> I had a, I had a, I had Cole's notes. I didn't hit them, and I never hit them. And I hate I, I hate that because I love having a plan and executing the plan. The plan never goes like that. Um, yeah, I appreciate it too. We uh, I wanted to get more into your story. I wanted to get more into uh, the philosophy, but the, I just eat the digital up, man. I just eat it up. Well, if you get enough listeners, I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Mark, thank you so much for your time. And uh, listeners, as always, thank you for rocking with us. Thank you so much. Wrap. <laughs>